okay hello everyone so this is the fourth section of the principles of patient assessment uh, I'm going to talk about in this video about chronic illnesses assessment chronic disease assessment okay so let's start with a scenario uh, you in the last video uh, DD uh, came to your pharmacy with headache two weeks later uh, the patient came to you with a new prescription of Ramipril, 2.5 milligrams PO orally daily for a newly diagnosed hypertension. Okay, so now how to assess a newly diagnosed chronic illness? And you do an initial, initial assessment of newly diagnosed diseases, you can use the acronym IESA, which is, stands for Indication effective safety and adherence so you need to ask your questions indications assess if the drug is indicated so the patient has hypertension does ramipril is ramipril indicated for hypertension okay even if it's indicated if is ask also yourself if the medication therapy is currently warranted can we do control non-pharmacological management instead of using Ramipril? So these questions you might ask yourself. Effective. Okay, now we decided we're gonna give Ramipril. Is it a good starting dose? And assess if the drug is prescribed as an, at, uh, an optimal treatment choice. So is this the first line agent? And if the dose of the medication is appropriate given the chronic disease? So if it's the first line and is this good effective dose? And the safety also you need to assess if this dose safe right determine if this medication is safe for individual patients given the patient specific characteristics like age comorbidities and allergies let's say the patient has renal dysfunction some medications need renal adjustment renal dose adjustment right also you consider for potential drug interactions looking at the patient co-medications co-administer co medications is there any drug interaction that could be harmful to the patient okay assess if the dose and frequency is appropriate for the indication many medications has multiple indications so and different dosing regimes regimens okay adherence also you need to check if the patient would be willing to adhere to the medication, which is very important, right? And pharmacist law to help brainstorm options to support patient adherence. Okay. As an example, uh, for uh, risk factors for non-adherence, uh, frequent medications, the medication taken four, three times a day to four times a day, uh, busy lifestyle, low health literacy, patient is not aware that uh, uh so for example hypertension sometimes it's called silent killer because it doesn't have symptoms in some patients uh, do i need treatment a uh, busy lifestyle like uh, they're busy uh you usually forget taking the medication language barrier like poor understanding of the directions for treatment uh, problems with dexterity or ability to self-administer medications. Patient has some neurological symptoms, unable to open the bottle. Uh, memory problems, dementia. Lack of motivation, like, like, what if I don't treat it? Am I might be going to be all right? So some questions like that, right? Uh, lack of understanding of the chronic condition, as similar to that. So if we're doing initial assessment for hypertension, for example, for that patient, I'll say indication. Ramipro was started for a newly diagnosed hypertension. Sure. Ask myself, does the patient hypertension require treatment with a pharmacological agent? Looking at the guidelines and evidence, is Ramipro the first line agent in patient with hypertension and no other comorbidities? That's a question you also should ask yourself. This is where the evidence kicks in, right? Effective is 2.5 milligram dose, reasonable initial treatment for DDD's hypertension. Okay, 
And when the, does DDD expect the treatment benefit? Adherence. Are there any issues that hinder adherence to teramiprol? Maybe you might say, you know, I'm good, right? But sometimes they have adherence issues. Maybe you don't have money in order to buy the medication. Like I say, insurance coverage. Safety. Is a prescribed dose safe given the patient renal and liver function? Is the prescribed medication safe given the patient concomitant medications like other medication the patient on? Okay, that's the initial assessment. Okay, but now after that comes to later on, right? Patient comes to your pharmacy two weeks later, came to your pharmacy, same DD patient complaining of dry cough for the last five days. Okay, so patient has dry cough, okay? And when you think about dry cough, uh, Ramipril, it's an AC inhibitor, and one of the common side effects of Ramipril is dry cough, okay? So is it caused by Ramipril? Think about it. Okay, so if you say yes, so now you did what we say is jumping into conclusions without proper data. What if I tell you the patient has other symptoms like fever, uh, uh, muscle aches, and so on? So maybe it's something else, right? Uh, it doesn't have to be a ramipril. But at the same time, common things are always common. Yeah, like, yes, dry cough is a common side effect of ramipril after exclusion of other causes, right? It's something that you think about. But here I want to think about ongoing assessment of chronic illnesses. We can do the two CAs acronym, two CAs. C's, two C's, control and complications, and two A's, adherence and adverse reactions, right? Okay. So adherence, you need to work with the patient to discover uh, any barriers to adherence and discuss the possible solutions, right? You need to check the control. Okay, so if the patient comes to you for even for a refill of a prescription, ask, is the, medic is the disease under control? Is the blood pressure under control? So assess to determine if the medication is currently effective at treating the specific chronic disease. Checking the adverse reactions, any adverse effects the patient is experiencing. Right, this is the other A, right? And the complications, often an indication uh, that when you see some disease complication, it could be an indication that the medication might not be effective or potentially the disease is progressing, right? So that's like, for example, there are many complications for diabetes, right? Like, and indicate poorly controlled diabetes. Uh, so you need to check. So for ongoing assessment, you check the two CAs, control, complications, adherence, and adverse reactions, okay? For example, for that hypertension, so say control, okay, is the blood pressure a target? Yeah. And you need to know that the evidence, uh, what, what target you need to target, right? Adherence, is the patient taking the medication as prescribed, right? Complication, is there any complications from her hypertension? Uh, adverse reactions. Is the patient experiencing any uh, adverse reactions from Rabobel? Right? So when you when you look into these, when you do the two CAs, you will not miss a drug-related problems related to hypertension. Right? Uh, I will show you that in an example of a complete medication review. So in the last video, we learned about symptom assessment. Right? And in this video, we'll learn about chronic illness assessment. And here, if you want now to do a complete medication reviews in some situations, like you're sitting with the patient, going over the history, and to do a medication review. So first, you, did, you do a comprehensive patient history, followed by writing the patient problem lists. Again, I'm repeating, it's a problem list, not a drug-related problem, okay? And then, okay, what types of problems? If it's a chronic illness, so if it's a new, I do IESA. If it's uh, 
ongoing assessment. So you do the do two CAs, as we said, right? If it's symptom, the patients, for example, are having diarrhea. So it's scholar for each symptom, you do scholar. Uh, abnormal lab and physical assessment findings. Also, like checking the labs, you found, oh, that's the yeah, hemoglobin A1C. However, uh, the patient does not have diabetes. So maybe the patient is diabetic and he doesn't know, right? So this probably worth further investigation or referral, okay? So I'll give you an example. NM, the 65 male, presented to your pharmacy for medication review. Was past medical history of hypertension and anemia. Uh, review of systems says unremarkable aside from uh, constipation. Medication patient takes hydrochlorothiazide for hypertension, 12.5 milligram once a day, started one year ago. Also, first gluconate, 300 milligrams once a day, started three months ago. So, when you look at that, what else do you need? Remember, from critical thinking, you need to think about what questions you need in order to answer your case here probably i need blood pressure values i need hemoglobin values and see the iron like a fixed patient anemia uh, i need to ask more questions about constipation right to see when this is happening or happened and so on okay so as an example here now the patient has how many problems hypertension anemia and constipation these are the problem lists right so problem list, the patient has hypertension, anemia, and constipation. So for hypertension, I will do the two CAs, and they found out that average blood pressure measures, like maybe the patient's blood pressure is under control or not. I check adherence, I check adverse drug reactions. For anemia, asking about also, so when I did the as asking question about the two CAs for hypertension, I found out that patient blood pressure is not under control. Now, this translates into a drug-related problem, right? So if the blood pressure is under control, I see NM blood pressure is not at target and requires therapy modification. Maybe a dose increase, adding an extra agent, and so on. By looking at anemia, I also do two CAs, or I, I uh, IESA as well, so uh, control, symptom control, uh, see if this is the CBC values, like I see what's the patient hemoglobin and so on, uh, and other measures of anemia, adherence, adverse reactions, the patient's taking uh, uh, iron correctly, is the patient experiencing adverse reactions? So based on that, I said I found out that the NM iron dosage is not sufficient to correct NM anemia. Probably you need more elemental iron in order to fix the anemia for this patient. As an example, uh, constipation, you do scholar, right? So scholar asking for any red flags, and you found out after doing the scholar, it looks like the iron is causing this, maybe. So we can say, see here, uh, NM is experiencing constipation secondary to iron therapy, and also reduced fluid intake when you ask the patient. And this requires additional therapy pharmacological and non-pharmacological, maybe non-pharmacological only, we'll see. So, so what I wanted to get from here, again, if the patient has a chronic illness to do IESA or acute illness or two CAs, same to me do the scholar and then also do further investigation of any other uh, findings you find in physical assessment or in lab findings, okay? And after that, after you listed the patient problem lists, after you do the assessment, I mean, collecting the data and asking these questions, you will be able to identify the drug-related problems related to that, okay? I just want you to differentiate between the problem list and the drug-related problem, okay? And if you are looking for further resources, what kind of question you need to ask for chronic illness assessment, chapters 12, to 21 in patient assessment in clinical pharmacy provide very useful uh, uh, guide uh, for some of the most common uh, chronic illnesses and how to assess those, okay? Now, we'll go to the uh, last sections of general principle of patient assessment. 
which has two important things you see in your practice is the drug interactions and adverse drug reactions, right? So by looking at the drug interactions, pharmacist deals with too many drug interactions on a daily basis. And some of them are real, some of those are not. They need to assess the clinical relevance and act accordingly. Never ignore a drug interaction until you are really sure that this interaction is not relevant to your patient or not of clinical significance. So some helpful tools that you can use, like know the nature of the interaction, right? Is this a pharmacokinetic interaction like a liver microsomal enzyme induction or inhibition? Is it a pharmacodynamic interaction like synergism and adverse drug reactions? Like for example, two nephrotoxic drugs taken at the same time. Uh, QT interval prolongers, like drugs that prolong the QT intervals taken together might increase the risk. Determine the relevance of the interaction to the patient. Might not be relevant to the patient, right? Determine the probability of that interaction. Uh, determine the clinical significance of the interaction as well. So if it's minor or major and so on. So each interaction, so you need to have interaction checker. One of the important things is there are some drugs, when you see them, please look slowly, see if there's any interactions. Those are classes of drugs that have multiple DIs, drug interactions. This includes anticoagulants, antimicrobials, antidepressants, statins, antiepileptic drugs, antineuplastic agents, cancer drugs, anti-rejection medications, and anti-tumor clauses. Okay? When you see those agents, you need to look carefully for interactions. Of course, for all other agents, you need to look for interactions, but these are the, one of the major ones. Adverse reactions. If a patient presents you the pharmacy during a follow-up, like a dry cough that you just saw, or comes to discuss a possible adverse drug reaction, an assessment is required to determine if it's drug-induced, right? So, for example, patient comes to you with dry cough after ramipril. is actually an adverse reaction from ramipril or another condition, right? You do the scholar first, right? And then after that, you need to ask some of these factors to consider. Temporality, like right? occurrence of the adverse drug reaction was the start of the drug. Like, by the time I started Ramipril, three or three, one week after, I got dry cough. That's temporality. The reported reaction fits with the drug possible adverse drug reactions. It's a well-known adverse drug reaction for Ramipril. If it's not a well-known adverse reaction, Check the drug monograph, check any reports of adverse drug reactions, and see if it actually happened to that, uh, uh, that agent caused that ADR before or not. Should be biologically plausible based on the drug mechanism of action, right? As I said, immunosuppressors, drugs can lead to infections, right? The reported reaction disappears or reverses after medication discontinuation. Let's say the patient who say, says, yeah, I had really bad constipation when I started taking iron. And then when I stopped it, constipation is gone. So this is something that's telling me that actually iron could be the causing factor for the patient constipation, right? Uh, there is uh, no alternative explanation of the patient reported adverse reactions. So... As I told you, a patient came with a dry cough. Maybe the patient have flu symptoms, right? And if there is no alternative explanation, and this is a known adverse reaction for the drug, so it is the drug, okay? So there is a really nice uh, tool. It's called the, the Narango's uh, adverse, reaction, adverse Drug Reaction Probability Scale. Uh, Naranjo, uh, it's actually asks you a few questions, some of the ones that I just mentioned to you, and you add a score for each one if the answer is yes or no or unknown, and you add the scores, and if it's more than nine, it's a definite that the drug causing these adverse reactions. If it's less than zero, it's unlikely, and so on. Okay, it's a very good tool, and the reference is here. It also is available in the patient assessment textbook. Okay, so you finish with all the assessments that we just mentioned. Uh, symptom assessment, chronic illness assessment. So after that, what's next? 
So now we did an assessment list of the issues, DRPs, right? You need to list the DRPs in priorities, like not just the one that are most important need to be addressing first. And then you, as you write your plan. Your plan here, if there are further tests needed, if there's any monitoring required, and if there's monitoring, what type of monitoring, when you're going to do that, how often, and who will follow up with that, right? Uh, and any management you need to do, and, and then referrer if needed. And document it. Documentation is very important. If you don't document it, it didn't happen, okay? Again, I'm reviewing for clinical decision making. You need patient history, best possible evidence, knowledge of the disease, drugs, and general principles like the ones that we're talking about. Final points to consider, complete assessment versus focused assessment. So if you're doing assessment, not for, uh, not, like, not for every patient you see, you have to do complete assessment that takes a long time, right? So it depends. And what is the time frame and how urgent you want to do the assessment? And please, please avoid the common mistakes. One of them is jumping to conclusions. Don't jump into conclusion without proper assessment uh, or doing incomplete patient history or asking irrelevant question. And at the end, proper assessment needs to proper plan and outcome improvement. Poor assessment leads to poor plan, risk of harm, and no benefits. Okay, that marks the end of the general principles of patient assessment lecture theories. Thank you.